Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Kelly from Wisconsin Land and Water, a 501c3 that supports the efforts of land conservation departments and committees throughout the state in a variety of ways, including helping to host trainings and events like this one. Before we begin, I just want to let everyone know that the webinar will be recorded and we're going to post it to the Wisconsin Land and Water website. I'll be following up with an email to everyone who registered so that you know when the recording is available online. You can watch it again, share it with other people, etc. Uh, we'll take questions today via the chat function and the Q&A function. So whichever works best for you, if you want to uh, send something into the chat for everyone to see or through the Q&A function of the webinar, feel free to submit a question at any time and we'll try to address as many of those as possible at the end of the presentation today. So today's presentation is Stormwater Treated, is presented by Megan Hogfeld and Carrie Roper. Uh, as a water resources specialist with the City of Superior Environmental Services Division, Megan has provided water quality outreach and education about stormwater and wastewater to residents, schools, and organizations for over five years. She works with about 50 volunteers throughout the year and is the media team lead for the Regional Stormwater Protection Team, a group that brings free educational messaging about stormwater to the Twin Ports region. Megan received her Bachelor of Science from the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point in land use planning and natural resources with a minor in soil science. She enjoys biking and rock climbing with friends and she attempts to swim in Lake Superior year round. <laughs> Uh, and Carrie is the Conveyance Program Manager with Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District. Uh, her day-to-day -day work includes being responsible for conveyance planning, including the development and management of capital projects to maintain or improve capacity and performance of the district's conveyance system. She manages the district's wet weather peak flow management program and works with municipal customers to help reduce inflow and infiltration. So with that, I will turn things over to Megan to get us started today. Thank you, Kelly. I'll share my screen. Let's see here how I want to present first and then share. We're getting there. We're getting there. And then there we go. Okay. Is stormwater treated? Uh, so as part of the Wisconsin Stormwater Week, um, we are talking about is stormwater treated today. Uh, today's theme is going to highlight um, different aspects of um, stormwater, wastewater, and then both uh, wastewater and stormwater together. Um, and uh, it's been going on for a week. We've been talking about this for a week. It's been a very great, um, uh, great program campaign. Uh, we have one more day with a theme that's tomorrow, Friday 27th. And then if anyone uh, has local events around the state with um, stormwater related topics, we encourage people to host them uh, through the weekend. Uh, so as mentioned, we're going to be discussing how throughout most of Wisconsin, stormwater is not treated by wastewater facilities, and we'll be going into detail um, on those um, to that topic. And uh, before we get going, uh, I want to make sure, we want to make sure that everyone understands what stormwater is. Uh, so stormwater runoff is rain and snow melt, and it flows over sidewalks, parking lots, roads, and it's carrying things like trash and oil or fertilizers to um, storm drains. And as kind of like depicted here in this uh, illustration, most storm drains in Wisconsin connect our streets to our streams. Uh, so we are, uh, unfortunately, anything that um, is coming from our trash cans, our pockets, our pets um, can end up in our the places we love. Um, for example, uh, for some cities, Wisconsin cities on the Great Lakes coast, uh, those pollutants entering storm drains flow to the nearest river and then to, for us, uh, Lake Superior, which is also our drinking water source. Uh, so it's really important to us um, uh, on our team over here at the city of Superior to protect one of the largest freshwater lakes. Um, 
And when we're talking about the different types of uh, systems, sewer systems, um, when we're mentioning that there's a municipal separate storm sewer system, the image, I'll use my mouse to kind of help direct this. I don't know if you can see that, but um, the image on the left, it's showing what a separate storm sewer system looks like. So the stormwater is being directed to storm drains, which then um, direct the stormwater to uh, nearest river or lake untreated. And then there are uh, pipes for wastewater, um, separate pipes for wastewater from your home, schools, and businesses that goes to the wastewater treatment plant. And then it gets treated and disinfected, and then it goes to our waterways. Um, but then on the right side, we have um, combined sewer systems. And that's where we just have one pipe for wastewater and stormwater. And um, then that all of that gets treated before entering our waterways again. And we do have this kind of circle with an X through it um, showing over like the overflows that could happen. Uh, typically, like in the past, historically, overflows were an issue. Uh, and today we're gonna highlight, uh, Carrie and I are gonna highlight how we've significantly reduced those um, problems with overflows um, through strategic planning um, and infrastructure. And so just wanna also highlight some examples of pollution. Um, you might be likely very familiar with these things. Um, for example, track out from construction, wash water from car washing, um, trash and litter from uncontained um, trash bins, pet waste, um, improperly disposed of hazardous materials. And then, um, then we just have like a storm drain connecting all of that to our waterways. Uh, and then we have some examples of pollution prevention practices uh, that are highlighted here. Um, some silt fences for construction sites, washing your car in the lawn so it helps to soak in those that grimy, dirty water before entering our waterways. Proper disposal of hazardous waste. Um, we have picking up after your pet, collecting rain, managing water where it falls, planting trees, picking up garbage. And then also some really great um, examples of, uh, I guess, green infrastructure practices where they're installing, they've installed pervious pavers or maybe like, I, I'm just gonna call these also pervious pavers, uh, where they're allowing for stormwater to infiltrate into uh, the soil rather than having a ton of impervious surfaces where that water is just rushing right off of the road or right into the storm drain without any form of infiltration. Um, and now we'd love you to take a polling question. Um, I'd love for you to take a polling question. Just a minute. Kelly, do you want me to just end this or? I can go ahead and, and I'll click end. Okay, cool. <laughs> Great. Um, so it looks like um, most of you, 70% um, of you do live in a city that has combined sewer, uh, which is fascinating. Um, love to hear more about that potentially. Um, so jumping right back in. Um, okay. mm -hmm. Able to, there we go. Okay. So talking about the city of superiors combined sewer facilities. So back in the uh, late 1800s, superiors combined sewers were built and then um, all of that combined wastewater, stormwater was directed to the St. Louis River untreated. Um, and so that was a long time ago that all that was happening. Um, excuse me, this is a picture, um, an illustration. Uh, the perspective is from the viewpoint of Lake Superior and it's looking on, it's looking to the Twin Ports. So on the left side is the city of Superior 
and the St. Louis River is kind of uh, the border between the two. It actually acts as the border, the Wisconsin-Minnesota border. And then on this side is Duluth, Minnesota. And uh, as I mentioned, St. Louis River, St. Louis River Estuary, and then Lake Superior. Uh, Twin Ports is one of the largest ports on the Great Lakes. And so import and export on these big ships are has been a very important part of our community for in, uh, since it was started a very long time ago, um, since it was established. And, um, but going back to treatment, uh, treatment wasn't established until um, the 19, 1958. Um, so up until then, all of our wastewater and stormwater would enter our St. Louis River and Lake Superior untreated. And so we didn't really have a management plan for the water pollution leaving our city up until we had this wastewater treatment plant established and the Environmental Services Division uh, that now manages the pollution from our community. Um, there's for about 27,000 people. Uh, so we have the wastewater treatment and stormwater management. Um, I'm just right now highlighting the stormwater infrastructure. Uh, this doesn't include all of the facilities that ESD, the Environmental Services Division manages, um, but we have um, over 3,000 storm drains. Um, I like to highlight the 13 stormwater ponds and basins um, two water quality basins, I'll touch on those later, two constructed wetlands, two wet ponds, um, and so on. So it's uh, quite a few things that we're managing up here. Um, and so in those MS4 areas, so most areas in Superior, stormwater does not get treated. And I, as, storm, as we've talked, stormwater runoff is one of the leading causes of surface water pollution. Um, and we're addressing that today because it's really important to um, learn ways to help prevent that pollution. But for now, when we're talking about it, we're learning why it's important to um, know where it goes. So when it rains, it drains to our river. So this is an example in Superior. This is another map, or I guess I've only showed you one map, but another example of the city of Superior. Um, this map right here, this is the city limits right here. This is the St. Louis River, and this is Lake Superior. So we have seven named streams so all that stormwater is directed to, or uh, most of the stormwater is directed to these streams and then eventually to Lake Superior. And as I mentioned, it's um, our drinking water source and it's one of the largest freshwater lakes on our planet. Um, so the city of Superior and all these other cities listed around Lake Superior hold the responsibility to protect it from pollutants that are leaving our city uh, because the water we use, uh, we have to return back to um, these waterways in the same water quality standard that we take it because, um, and hopefully this is a little um, little uh, refresher for you with the water cycle. Um, I like to talk about the water cycle because if we didn't have water, we wouldn't exist. Uh, so we use it every day. Uh, we're interacting with it every day, at least here up in Superior, we're almost completely surrounded by it. Um, so the water cycle is the way that the water is recycled and used throughout the world or moved throughout the world. So when, um, what's great about this is it has a natural cleaning process. So when it, the precipitation, the snow or rain moves across the surface of the world, um, some of it will infiltrate into the soil, which is a natural cleaning process. Um, when we create these bigger cities, um, like the city of Superior or city of Milwaukee, uh, we create a lot of impervious surfaces and we're not allowing for that water to infiltrate into the soil for that natural cleaning process. So we're increasing the stormwater pollution and runoff um, and reducing the infiltration. Uh, so when we're intaking that water, we're using it, we're borrowing it, and then we're, we're cleaning it and sending it back. Uh, when we're using it, that's an example of wastewater. So we're using it and then it's dirty. Um, these are some, some sources of wastewater. Some examples, uh, showers, bathtubs, dishwashers, all of this wastewater is coming from our homes, schools, and businesses, and then it flows for miles and miles um, underground. It's a series of sewer lines. Um, it's pretty incredible what's happening underneath our feet at all times. Um, and then lift stations are also helping to move that wastewater to the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, this is an example of Superior's water life cycle. Um, just looking at kind of like the wastewater side of things. Um, 
we're we're one of the only I think we are actually the only city in Wisconsin that has a private company, uh, Superior Water, Light and Power, that intakes the drinking water, cleans it and then distributes it to the city of Superior. And um, then we use it, turns into wastewater, and then we clean it here at the wastewater treatment plant and send it back to Lake Superior um, treated and disinfected. And uh, Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewage District has something very similar. Um, and said their intake is in Lake Michigan. Um, a few cities intake water from Lake Michigan and then distribute it to the metropolitan area. So it's a much bigger space uh, than the city of Superior, uh, which is really fun to kind of compare um, the difference in size and scale um, with Milwaukee. Um, so we talked about stormwater, we talked about wastewater, uh, what is combined um, sewer, um, treatment, what, is, what does it mean? Uh, so I'm going to use Superior as an example. Um, Superior and Milwaukee are the two cities in Wisconsin that have combined systems and treatment. Um, and it includes both stormwater and wastewater in one pipe. Uh, so here is, again, a map of the city of Superior. It's an image with all the different details here. And the green on this map highlights the combined, combined sewer branches. And um, so we have three different districts or neighborhoods that the combined sewers and um, treatment facilities are located. And um, they're, they're kind of these older parts of our, our community, um, but they're, they serve a really great purpose um, during these high flow events. Um, we can use those basins. I'll show you a picture of what those basins look like um, as a place to store all that combined wastewater. Because when you think about it, when we have these high flow events, we are receiving, so high flow being uh, big rain events, or where we have a lot of spring snow melt that happens very quickly, um, all of that excess stormwater is rushing to our combined sewer systems in those three different neighborhoods. And those are the kind of things that can cause overflows. Um, so we have to prepare, uh, strategically plan for those kind of things to help prevent them from happening. Uh, but these basins are so large that they can actually act as a storage space for flooding that happens to reduce flooding in streets and flooding in superior residence basements. Um, but this is a picture of the Nemaji River in Superior during the summer of 2018 after major rain events. So Highway 2 goes through Superior and it crosses over the Nemaji River. It's one of our larger rivers that goes through the city. And uh, as you can see, the road goes also through the floodplain of the river and floodplains are uh, designed to help expand the river when we have these bigger flood events so that the river can you know, move and ebb and flow of a river is actually supposed to change like the size and shape over time. Um, so it affects our infrastructure, it impacts our infrastructure. Uh, so just diving right into our combined sewer treatment plants um, so we have three combined sewer treatment plants and one wastewater facility, and we call that our main facility. And I'll be discussing the three treatment facilities, uh, combined sewer treatment facilities. So when I say CSTP, that means combined sewer treatment plant. So the first one, um, so these were built back in the 1970s, and I love these old pictures, um, and they, they're archived, and I luckily found them. Uh, this is... This basin is receiving, or this uh, CSTP is receiving combined sewage from the Central Business District. Um, and it's actually located right next to the main uh, facility, the wastewater treatment facility. And the basin is about 12 acres large and a uh, maximum capacity of 75 million gallons and a treatment capacity of 90 million gallons per day. And on average, uh, about 25 days of annual discharge. So this is when it's um, discharging treated combined uh, wastewater. So this is where it's located um, and it's taking all of the combined sewer water from the central business district. So right over here, um, it's a very big basin and we have things called solar bees floating in them. I think we have six and what they do is they're using the power of the sun to generate energy for a little 
um, motor to um, move propellers to help aerate the water in um, the basins. And so the main treatment of these basins is um, screening. We have massive screens that the wastewater, the combined water moves through, and then it enters the basin for settling for treatment and then um, biological treatment as well. That's why the, we want aeration to help with that, the living organisms in the combined wastewater. Combined, yeah, combined wastewater. Um, the second uh, combined, the CSTP is in the fifth district. That's why we named it five. Um, and it's in South Superior. It's about 3.2 acres in size. And the capacity is 12 million gallons. And the treatment capacity is 8 million gallons per day. And then it discharged about, on average, 13 days of treated combined. Um, and the location on the map is way down here in South Superior. Um, and I forgot to mention in the previous slide, um, so this, this treatment facility, when it is discharging, uh, you can see this is the actually the Namaji River right here. And so it's discharging to a tributary um, that's leading to the Namaji. Um, and CSTB2 is discharging directly into the estuary uh, once it's um, treated the combined uh, wastewater. CSTB6, so this is in Billings Park neighborhood, um, District 6. It's about 5.7 acres. The capacity, um, max capacity is about 6.5 million gallons. And the treatment capacity is 8 million gallons per day, um, similar to CSTB5. And then the aver average annual days of discharge is about 10 days. And this is where it is located over very close to the St. Louis River. Um, and it's gonna be discharging to a small bay um, connected to the St. Louis River. Um, I live in Billings Park and I, one day when I first moved there, I was like, oh, what's that smell? <laughs> what is that? And it was when they had fully drained the basin and there was all whatever had settled um, left over. It gets a little stinky in the spring sometimes. Um, and so uh, the combined sewer overflows have significantly reduced uh, because the city has been proactive. Um, the last combined sewer overflow was in June 2018. Um, and this is because of um, strategic plans for wet weather operations. As I mentioned, uh, we can reduce the amount of water in the basins um, in preparation for um, those rain events, those larger rain events. And we can actually pump combined wastewater from these treatment facilities to the main wastewater facility to actually treat that water, that combined water as wastewater. Um, so sometimes we are fully treating all of that combined wastewater as wastewater. Uh, we also, uh, the city has uh, installed stormwater basins and a constructed wetland in those neighborhoods that have combined um, to help reduce the amount of stormwater from entering the combined sewers, um, just as a way to help support it. Um, also to say, as of now, the goal is not to remove combined um, sewers and treatment, um, but these basins and constructed wetland are just helping to reduce the amount of stormwater entering those basins at the time. Um, and then I'd like to highlight that the city of Superior received an outstanding performance in wastewater treatment plant special projects in relation to combined sewer preventing combined sewer overflows um, in 2019, which is um, a pretty, pretty cool um, thing to reflect on because we've just overall reduced the amount of overflows. Um, and this was presented by the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Um, time. Okay, didn't get. So um, in addition to um, those different practices, uh, the stormwater pollution and combined sewer overflow prevention also includes other City of Superior green infrastructure projects that encourage management of stormwater and um, treatment of stormwater before it enters our waterways or the combined sewer treatment um, entering it at all. And then also we have annual rain barrel workshops. Um, so we're we're gonna actually host three rain barrel workshops this year. Uh, one of them is a partnership with the county, Douglas County, and then the two workshops will be um, just directly for um, city residents. 
Um, it's definitely a need and a want from residents. So it's really fun that we can offer that. Um, and this is a picture of one of our residents, Conrad, uh, one of his, his barrels that he built. And I'd like to do a shout out to MMSD. Um, they helped us and um, I guess Chris Schultz um, and I discussed quite a bit in detail on what kind of barrels to purchase. And he recommended these barrels. Um, they're fantastic. Um, so far, we really liked working with them and the residents seem to really like them too, because look, you can put a cute plant on top of it, um, which is pretty sweet. Um, all right, I'm gonna turn it over to Carrie. Uh, she will also be touching more on stormwater pollution and combined sewer overflow prevention as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. That was a great job. Oh, thanks. I'm just going to start sharing my screen. Okay. Um, is that good? It looks like I'm sharing. It's great. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I'm Carrie Roper, uh, the Convenience Program Manager at MMSD. Okay. So MMSD serves 1.1 million customers in 28 municipalities. Uh, we have a service area of 352 square miles and a combined sewer service area of 24 square miles. And that's shown in the orange part of the figure. Uh, MMSD has two water reclamation facilities. One is the Jones Island Water Reclamation Facility and the other is the South Shore Water Reclamation Facilities. Both of these facilities treat wastewater before it enters Lake Michigan. Um, also shown on this figure are the legs of our uh, inland storage system. And so we'll be talking about that uh, throughout this presentation. There are three main river systems that pass through the combined sewer area in Milwaukee and discharge into Lake Michigan. The downtown area of Milwaukee is in the combined sewer service area, as well as the surrounding residential areas that are highly impervious, meaning there is a lot of hardscape, a lot of what Megan had talked about, um, and not a lot of opportunity for rainwater to absorb into the ground. So it becomes stormwater runoff, which contains pollutants. An example of, the, of how impervious our system is, is that our Kinnikinnick River watershed is considered the most impervious watershed in the whole state of Wisconsin. So we have a lot of runoff coming out of these areas. Um, and so much of what it what is falling uh, in these areas becomes stormwater runoff. And um, in the combined sewer area, instead of going directly into the waterways, it is treated at, one, at the Jones Island Water Reclamation Facility. Um, and so as we have heard, a separate system is two separate systems for wastewater and stormwater. Um, so wastewater goes into uh, municipal sanitary sewers, discharges into a large metropolitan interceptor sewer and is carried down to the water reclamation facility for treatment. Similarly, during dry weather flow, uh, the combined sewer system takes wastewater from businesses and residences and also discharges to a metropolitan interceptor sewer, which all gets um, goes to treatment. Um, when it rains, um, storm water in the separate sewer area discharges directly to a nearby waterway. So there's no, typically no treatment. Um, also some storm water makes it into local sanitary sewer system that all still continues to be discharged into the interceptor. And then anything that cannot be taken by the interceptor in Milwaukee gets discharged into the uh, storage system or deep tunnel as it's referred to sometimes. In the combined sewer service area, we have um, both wastewater and stormwater going into one pipe and that also discharges to the interceptor system, which then goes into the tunnel. So uh, during wet weather, we are taking flow into the treatment plant as well as uh, trying to store as much, um, as much as we can to treat later on. 
Unfortunately, at times we do have uh, extreme wet weather events. And when this uh, happens, stormwater fills the system and overflows can occur. Uh, they can occur from the combined sewer area as well as from the separate. And the reason we have overflows is to, um, if, we, if they weren't there, we'd have backups uh, into the street and possibly basements. Um, overflows from the separate sewer area are less frequent. Um, they are more concentrated with wastewater uh, and they're not allowed uh, through our permit with the DNR. Uh, and we are continually working to prevent overflows in both both areas um, throughout the system. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, what we've done to date. So um, the inline storage system has been a, a large step in Milwaukee's history at reducing overflows. It was first constructed in 1993 with um, a 405 million gallons of storage capacity it was expanded in 2006 and is now 432 million gallons. Um, it's as listed in the slide, 25 miles long. Um, the legs were shown in that one figure. It, it ranges from 17 feet in diameter to 32 feet and um, goes as deep as about 300 feet, which is about a 30 story building. Um, we also have in our northwest side a northwest side remote storage facility, and this facility um, captures uh, excess flows from our separate sewer service area, and it's 88 million gallons. It's seven miles long, it's 20 feet in diameter, and it uh, is about 150 feet deep. And um, it's relieves uh, it relieves the system to avoid overflows from that area. Um, so the Jones Island Water Reclamation Facility was put into operation in 1925, and the South Shore Water Reclamation Facility was put into operation in 1968. Each plant has a set capacity to handle wet weather flow. The wet weather treatment capacities are included on this slide. The stormwater and wastewater stored in the storage system can be pumped to treatment and that capacity it can pump up to 210 million gallons a day and while this is a lot sometimes we do have to wait um, in order to pump out the storage tunnel um, because we already have we may be already at capacity for the treatment facilities um, and we can't exceed that so we can only pump what we are able to treat during wet weather and so oftentimes we pump out later so it truly acts as a storage system, but we try to treat as much as possible during wet weather. Um, so flow, as Megan described, flow from the combined sewer area and, and stormwater runoff responds really, really quickly. And then in addition to that, our combined sewer area is really close to the treatment plant. So uh, what flows really increase very, very fast uh, compared to the separate sewer area where it takes a little bit longer to get into the sewer system and then is also further away from treatment. So we don't really see uh, flows increasing uh, in the separate sewer area, area until much later. And because of that, we want to be able to reserve space in our storage tunnel for uh, separate sewer inflow. Uh, so we take on the, as much as combined sewer inflow as we can and then we do reserve a little bit of space for the separate area. And we do that by using precipitation forecasting and radar to estimate volumes that'll be coming in. All right, so um, since the inline storage system was put into operation, stormwater from the combined sewer area is most often captured and treated before going to Lake Michigan. This figure includes the number of days per year with rainfall, as well as the number of overflow events that have occurred in that year. Prior to 1994, overflows were much more frequent, around 50 to 60 times per year. And since 1994, MMSD is able to capture capture and treat almost all of the stormwater that enters the sewer system. Um, MMSD cleans billions of gallons of wastewater every year. The EPA sets a goal of 85% for capture and uh, the percent in, in the Milwaukee metropolitan area is much higher, 98.6%. 
We are not satisfied with this, however, and we are working at reducing uh, overflows even further. And part of what we are doing today to reduce overflows is that we have many programs that work with municipalities and other partners in our service area to install green infrastructure, which captures rainwater where it falls so that it doesn't become stormwater runoff. Green infrastructure is sustainable stormwater management facilities that capture, absorb, and store rain and melting snow. Green infrastructure takes on numerous shapes and sizes from a 55 gallon rain barrel, as Megan showed us, uh, to stormwater trees, forest pavers for parking lots, and also green roofs. So a green roof stores water that lands on top of the building and stores it before it becomes runoff. Bioswales and bioretention collect stormwater from roadways and sidewalks um, and allow it to infiltrate more flow into the ground. Porous pavers and porous pavement allow stormwater to absorb um, and get into the ground. It's captured, the stormwater is captured below the roadway in order to infiltrate. Uh, stormwater trees help to soak up the stormwater from the ground and it also holds rainwater and leaves and branches for evaporation. Uh, they can be used in conjunction with engineered soils and other types of uh, green infrastructure and they work best when they're mature. And then um, residents can also install green infrastructure. And um, we have several programs in Milwaukee um, and Superior has uh, programs ongoing as well. Um, so rain barrels are oftentimes a 55 gallon drum uh, that can capture water from a downspout and it can be later used for watering gardens and plants in your, oh, sorry about that. In your yard, rain gardens act much like bioswales and bio uh, retention, but they're at a smaller scale. Um, so they collect stormwater from a downspout driveway um, and it's absorbed by the plants and stored in the ground. Um, native landscaping, native plants that provide a deep growing root system that help break up the soil, allowing more stormwater to drain into the ground. And soil amendments are another thing that could be done. Um, development of a thick root system that absorb more water in your yard, essentially transforming a lawn to a stormwater sponge. Um, and all of these types of strategies can be, um, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about them, uh, freshcoastguardians.com includes a bunch of information on all these different types of green infrastructure. So you're welcome to um, check that website out for more information and for uh, ways uh, you can make changes in your yard if you're interested in. Um, and that was it. Um, so now we can uh, work to have questions. Mm -hmm. um, is stormwater treated? Thank you, Carrie, and thanks, Megan, uh, both for your presentations today. We did have one question come in early on in the presentation, and that was, is there a list of which mun municipalities have separated versus combined systems? But And if not, uh, how would someone find which, which one is in their community? Uh, well, I... I'll try to take that. Uh, so in the state of Wisconsin, Superior and MMSD are the only two um, cities that have combined sewer systems. Um, and I, I'm not exactly sure how to find out about other states, but um, that's what's uh, for our state. Great, thank you. Um, and I will throw out there too to anyone attending. Um, and I see we have another question come through the chat. If, if anyone wants to um, ask a question aloud, doesn't want to doesn't want to type it out, you can also use the raise hand function and um, we'll be able to allow you to use your microphone to ask questions that way as well. Um, but another question that just came in is the main reason that there aren't more combined systems the cost or what is the reason if if not? Uh, I, I think for combined sewer systems, it's a matter of, um, I think, history, development, and timing. Um, 
separate sewer systems are uh, more prevalent in um, development that had occurred at later times and, and perhaps under different circumstances. Um, so I, I don't know the reason why um, maybe Milwaukee has a combined sewer system and, and Green Bay doesn't or something like that, but I think it was just a, a matter of um, uh, who was you know, making decisions and, and, and making designs at the time and trying to solve the problem of, of just having direct wastewater get into um, the waterways. And so I think some different solutions developed. Sure. Yeah, and I, I guess um, I'll add to that. I think, um, I definitely agree. I think it depends on the decision makers, the leaders in the community, um, and also road construction. Um, uh, road construction and um, the integrity of the combined sewer systems. Um, so I know in Superior, where we did separate out some of those combined sewer districts and um, systems within those districts, um, we had a lot of road construction, which allowed for that separation to happen. Um, and it made sense at the time to do that. Um, and I think the other big part that plays into that is like, are these combined sewer systems still functioning as they should? Um, are they holding that water in those pipes? Um, if they're not, then that could be another reason why they've been replaced. Um, but I think overall, I think cities just have a, whole, a, a difficult time having the space for stormwater. Um, like we have those, like I mentioned, those three big basins that help to provide storage for all that storm combined stormwater and wastewater because big, in those big rain events, there's nowhere for that water to go but those basins um, in those combined sewer district areas. So some cities don't have the space for those big basins to help with storage. Um, so that's where those overflows would happen. Um, for the city of Superior, we have, um, we're pretty rural for the most part, we're a pretty small city. So we have the ability to have those big spaces for um, combined and um, it's really benefited our community. Um, in that sense. So I think there's a lot of reasons why um, combined sewers have been replaced or not replaced. It's a, not a very easy question to answer. I hope we I hope we answered it okay. Megan, while on the topic of those basins, a uh, question that came in on the um, webinar chat here, what is the treatment process for the combined basins in Superior? Uh, so uh, the combined sewer treatment um, or combined wastewater treatment is a little different than wastewater treatment, and it's guided by the DNR and EPA, where it's both stormwater and wastewater, so it's not all wastewater. Um, so the treatment is a little, um, is definitely different where there's screening, that's part of the treatment, and then settling and um uh, biological activity where that helps to break down the organic material in the, the, the combined wastewater. And then eventually um, there'll be more, there's like a couple different other steps that involve more settling. And then um, depending on how quickly the combined wastewater goes through the facility, um, depending on the urgency, the need for that storage space, there might be some chlorine um, contact. Uh, with that co combined wastewater, treated wastewater. Otherwise, as I mentioned in the presentation, we actually, the city of Superior has the ability to pump the, the water from those basins, the combined basins to our wastewater facility to go through the facility there. And that includes um, seven steps of treatment and disinfection. So um, at times our combined wastewater is receiving the same type of treatment as our wastewater. Um, so when we're discharging, as I mentioned, there's like there's like 25 days of, I think it was something like 25 days of on average annually that the combined sewer treatment plant in district two is actually discharging from the actual combined sewer treatment plant. Those are the only days within the year that we're, we're just treating and discharging from um, that facility. Otherwise we're sending the water through our main, our main wastewater facility. So there's quite a few steps uh, that we take to help prevent contamination in our waterways. Um, oh, service storm sewers only. Oh, I went through the combined. Um, sorry. 
I got I got right on the, the combined sewer track. My apologies. Uh, co contamination of waterways from areas served by storm sewers only. So we do have, so as I um, Kelly mentioned in the introduction, I do outreach education on stormwater. And so we offer volunteer programming that has, uh, we have an adoptive storm drain program. We have a citizen stream monitoring program. And then um, cleanups, City of Superior offers cleanups. So there's a number of things that we're doing to help prevent pollution. And we have a handful of uh, published materials that we provide um, to our residents and community to help with um, just educating people. Because what's the biggest thing is we have to make sure that people know why it's important to help prevent pollution. Um, I hope that answered your question. Feel free to pop up another question if I didn't answer it. Yes, and we had another one come in through the chat as well uh, in regards to those mechanisms for storage. Do the Superior Basins or Milwaukee's Deep Tunnel ever get cleaned out? Um, there was a comment that Megan mentioned about the odor in the springtime. Um, I, I can start real quick just for the um, for the inline tunnel storage system. Yes, we do. Um, it is every 10 years. Uh, when we first went online, it was recommended to do so every five years. Um, and as inspections had occurred, it was realized that um, we could wait and, and, and clean it out every 10 years. So we do a, a full inspection uh, and a clean out um, at that every decade. It's a annual, um, yeah, with the basins, um, annual cleaning procedure where the water um, before winter gets uh, reduced. Um, we just don't have as much water during the winter because most of the time it's frozen. Um, all the water is frozen. So I think every fall and spring there could be a type of um, annual cleaning. And then um, the, uh, the sewers themselves, there's inspections throughout the year. Um, I think it's based on the, the um, engineer techs based it on the um, districts um, or neighborhoods, and then they have a schedule for which year each district is checked. And um, we have a vector truck that is like a giant vacuum that comes in and sucks everything up. And then that's disposed of um, correctly to um, the landfill. Carrie, follow-up question for your response. What does that every 10 years cleaning process look like? Um, uh, I haven't been involved with it specifically, but I, I believe they have, um, there's some sediment removal because there's settling within the storage tunnel. So when uh, the flows get in there, a lot of the solids settle to the bottom. So there's a lot of that. It kind of gets vacuum cleaned out. And um, we've also found some large objects uh, basketballs, uh, I think parts of a bicycle at one point. Um, so there's some large objects that somehow manage to get make their way um, down into the tunnel and get collected. And what they found too is a lot of that debris ends up very much so at the downstream end. So um, it can be really um, a specific location to clean and get the majority of, of it cleaned um, by focusing in those areas. That tunnel is impressive. <laughs> It's so cool that I, yeah, I'm just blown away by that type of stormwater management. It's really, or combined. Yeah, it's, it's really, it's very large, it's massive. Uh, is there a way to know specifically which waterway a community's separated stormwater goes? Yeah, I think it depends on the, the community. Um, I know we have a GIS system that shows where um, where the storm storm drains and then the, the conveyance system, the pipes lead to. Um, and we have outfalls and outfall screenings. So outfalls are the, the ends of the pipes that lead to the stream. Um, yeah, and so we have a full system, but sometimes, I mean, that, that hasn't been around for very long. So sometimes we find stuff and we're like, oh, this is here. And so um, some communities still don't have those kind of GIS uh, systems because um it's it's difficult to then okay where are the pipes where are the storm drains where are the manholes where are the outfalls um it's all underground um carrie do you have anything to add to that 
Um, yeah, a similar answer. Um, we do have a GIS system. We do have some published documents that show watersheds. So when uh, people use the word watershed, that's like the area that's draining to a specific waterway. And then when you have subwatersheds, those are like the areas that might be um, draining to a tributary of that waterway. So the Milwaukee watershed is what's tributary to the Milwaukee River. Um, but then there's sub watersheds in that that go to different creeks and different branches that come out of there. So you could look um, potentially, I, I don't know where off the top of my head, um, but if you if you look for watershed searches online, you might be able to find some maps and stuff of things um, in your specific area if you're interested. Yeah, and maybe connect with either oh, if there's a water quality group. Um, and I, I guess... Um, I've been working with folks across Wisconsin, uh, it, specifically in stormwater and water quality. So um, I can also, um, I think at some point we'll add our emails to the chat, but feel free to reach out and I can always be like, oh, you live here? Well, I know this person that lives there that knows what streams and, and stormwater um, conveyance systems can connect to those streams or whatever it is. And I think that is public information. So you can ask for that kind of stuff from, um, a city that you live in, um, you can ask from, you have any type of public works offices, you can ask for that kind of information from them. Awesome. Well, not seeing any other questions coming in through the Q&A or through the chat, but thank you to everyone for submitting those questions. Um, I We'll turn it to either of you if you have any closing remarks. And I can also, I'll, a reminder to everyone that I'll share out the recording for this webinar if you want to watch again or share. And I can include Megan and Carrie's contact information so that if you do have any additional questions or follow-up, I'm sure they wouldn't, wouldn't mind responding to any questions. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I do tours um, of the wastewater treatment plant here in Superior, and we do green infrastructure tours of the basins, and um, so always interested in in providing uh, public education for water quality conversations. So reach out if you want to hang out. And uh, we do have doors open in Milwaukee uh, this weekend. I believe um, on Saturday, there'll be uh, tours of Jones Island. So if you're in, in the area or visiting the area, um, I believe you can sign up um, for a tour. Um, look for doors open Milwaukee and the, there's more information on that. And I've toured Jones Island and it's very fun. Very cool tour. <laughs> Well, thank you again, Megan and Carrie, for your, your great presentations today. Uh, and everyone, enjoy the rest of your Thursday afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly, for hosting. Yes, thank you.